Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, my name is Cyril. I'm the managing director at Compass. So I'm very, very, very much honored to be here. Um, there are many among you who helped me grow my knowledge. So to become what I am. And uh, there are also many among you who, where I helped grow your knowledge. So it's uh, like family. So cool to be here. Um, I brought the topic which I, I did an apprentice as an electronics technician and uh, electrons are still kind of fascinating to me. So um, that's a topic I know some stuff about. I'm not a technician or a substation engineer, so I'm a layman basically. And I try to explain what's going on in the electric grid from a IT guy perspective. So that's how I understand the grid and I hope you will be understanding it later on as well. So there are many misconceptions. Um, that's a stock footage image from Microsoft Office. Uh, it's nice, so the glowing lines. Actually, there are several mistakes in that picture. So the top line, that, that's usually the earth or ground line, so it's not carrying any current, so it couldn't glow. Uh, there are insulators at the top, so there are no insulators needed for ground and earth connections. And for the remaining lines, the insulators are glowing as well. Actually, the line hanging below should be glowing because that's the part that carries the electricity. So. I will recap a bit the techniques and tactics from the Ukraine blackouts uh, 10 years ago um, to get you an intro, then we'll see what happened in Switzerland so far. I will talk about grid, substation equipment, and protection mechanisms, some protocols. I will here and there show tools um, and then recap what's currently going on there. So here we go. Um, back December 23rd, so Christmas 2015, 230,000 people were affected by a blackout, so about one to six hours. And uh, actually, the attack was kind of credential stuffing, access to VPN, then they used standard ISIS tools and used the control and the command center HMI, so we call this a GUI, they call this a human machine interface. So they used this one to actually disconnect some stuff there. They did also some destructive uh, things like uh, corrupt firmware putting on those devices displayed there so that the Ethernet to serial connector wouldn't work anymore. So it's hard then to restore a substation if you're going to corrupt systems. Um, one year later, and probably this is time because in winter you need more electricity, so it, it hurts more. Uh, part of Kiev went dark. Um, there they deployed first a uh, real dedicated malware, so that came with a ton of protocols, all with their separate DLLs. Um, then they tried to toggle the breaker to force eye landing. So they did also try to denial of service those intelligent electronic devices like the Siemens Ciprotec. And they tried to wipe the PCM 600 engineering files. You probably have no clue, right? So it's my aim to make you understand within the next 40 minutes what this really means. Yeah. <clears throat> Here we go. That's a map of Switzerland. It's a transmission network. So if you ever see photo footage or videos from the control room in Aura from Swiss Grid, if there are red lines, this is not a problem. It's just the 380 kilovolt lines. Yeah. So the green ones are the 220 kilovolts. Uh, we had problems in Switzerland as well. Well, more in Italy, actually. So there was a branch hanging into the Lukmanier line. Uh, so that didn't like it. So the protection system concluded, well, we're gonna, we're gonna cut this line. Uh, Italy is at that time was importing lots of electricity from Switzerland. So the lines through the Mizox and through the Pushlav went dark as well. So they didn't like it either. And there are some connections from Italy to France as well, so they decided not to carry the additional load which Switzerland cut uh, as well, so Italy went dark. 
Then we had another incident. Uh, SPB for a big part runs their own generators and their own network on their own frequency. And back in 2005, um, they had about three lines in the area of Lucerne. Two of them needed to be disconnected because of maintenance work on the Highway A2. And um, they believed that the third line would actually carry the, the energy that would be needed. Uh, the problem was that some technician guy documented the capability of the line wrong, and uh, the line decided to, to be cut off. Then what basically happened is north and south of Switzerland were disconnected. Most of the generators are in the Alps region, so they had overcapacity and decided to turn them off to protect themselves. So in northern Switzerland was about 200 megawatts missing, and Germany couldn't deliver this on short notice um, as well. So SPB was dark for about three hours. That's it. I haven't heard of any cyber incidents. Maybe some NCSC or box guys know more. I'm sure those companies got malware. Uh, no idea how far they got. So for the grid, um, all that transmission lines are operated by Swiss grid. Um, there are some substations. They maintain uh, many transformers and transport about 75 terawatts energy a year. Uh, if you are concerned if we could swap our dinosaur choose engine cars into electric cars, and if there is sufficient energy, then, well, a rough calculation says it's going to be about 15 terawatt hours a year. Uh, 15 terawatt hours is still less than what we sell in electricity to Italy each year, right? So that's about 20 terawatt hours. So it would be possible. Um, for all the other lines, so lower voltage lines, they are being operated by so-called distribution system operators. And uh, so we have electricity cables buried under us that reach about six times around the globe, just in Switzerland. We talk about levels. So the first level, we've seen this on the map, that's level one. That's uh, the high voltage level, which is operated by Swiss grid. Then what you have on your outlet at home is about 400 volts. So we need to get down there. So there are several levels. It's exactly seven. So this level seven is what you have at home. Um, and in between these levels, you need to step down the voltage. So we need, we need to make big voltage into small voltage. And this is where transformers and substations come into play. Basically, a substation is kind of, you have an incomer. That's where the voltage comes in. Then there are some measurement tooling. There is some switch tooling. Then there is the transformer, so it makes high voltage to lower voltage. Then there is again measurement uh, instrumentation. There are switches again. And there's the outgoing line. We call this the feeder. This is a picture of Laufenburg. Laufenburg was in the beginning of the electricity network in Switzerland very important. So after the Second World War, Germany had a electricity short, shortage. Uh, France had overproduction, but they didn't like to talk to each other. So Switzerland decided, as we are, to go the, to go the diplomatic way, and we offered them to basically introduce a, the, it's called the Star of Laufenburg, which was built 1958. And uh, that handled much of the transfer current. So we're basically, we got money to transfer electricity from France to Germany. Uh, nowadays, there are many interconnections, so it's not so important. It's still a big field, uh, an important one, but uh, it would probably work without it. So if a plane falls on it, then we can probably live without it for some time. There's another picture that's also from Laufenburg. Um, it's all built on structures and poles, so it's uh, that you can walk under, so it's high voltage, so you need to be far away. Um, there are insulators, so they keep the lines away from the structure, so they, we don't want arcs 
that go back to the to the structure. Um, if you ever hear talk them about droppers, that's not what we understand on the droppers, right? Droppers are these lines that fall from above. So the two guys there, um, the physical social engineers among us. Um, untrained people need five meters distance. Trained people about four meter. So uh, we we had a problem in Zurich. So Zurich went dark because of a squirrel, right? And the important notice is at the very bottom. So that squirrel died. And dear social engineers, an open gate might be very tempting to you, yeah? But don't go there, it's a hell's gate. Be careful. So the transformer I mentioned is a very important thing uh, to have. So that's the transport of a new transformer. They had be, have been replaced in the past years because they were becoming some kind of bottleneck. Um, so this is a huge guy, very heavy. So it's about the size of a lorry. Um, that's its electrical pictogram. Um, there is more important um, stuff like the circuit breaker. So that is used to actually switch the high voltage and the high load. So the problem, let's say, if you are at home pushing your switch, it's just metal contacts that open and close with 400 volts. That's easy. Um, for high voltage, that's footage I captured on my own. So that's from the Technorama. It's about uh, one to two meters. So one one kilovolt could jump about a millimeter in dry weather. So with 400 kilovolts, that means it's at least 40 centimeters. If it's rainy, snowy, if there is ice, then it's going to be more. So there is a reason why you need distance of four or five meters from these things. So the problem is when you open a a contact, then the, the arc is basically going there. So that's what we see on the picture, the arc. With the Tesla coil in Technorama, we have very high voltage but low current. So this is not much a problem. In a substation, we have high voltage and high current. So meaning this generates, these arcs generates lots of heat. It's not only melting contacts, metal contacts could just vaporize. There is also phenomenes like, like um, arc flashes. These are kind of energy explosions, and this would injure people that are nearby. So the five monitors won't save you. So therefore, we need some arc quenching approaches. So we need to kind of blow out the arc. Sometimes they have some oil in their tanks. Um, they all ev vaporizes, and then quenches the arc as well. There is some special in insulation gas or latest generation is built using vacuum techniques. So that's really important. Then we have some, some small switches. So that, that's my yoga slide. So we have the horizontal breaker that does like this. Yeah. Then we have the knee that does like this. So then we have the double double breaker. That's the center post to this like switch like this, and that uh, we have the the pantograph. It, it grabs the bar at the top, right? So the bus bar. Um, yeah, they do all the same. So connect and disconnect. They are used to actually free up or insulate isolate parts of the infrastructure that you can do maintenance uh, or maybe ground it whatsoever. They cannot be switched on the load. If you switch them on the load, they will spark an arc. We don't want this, right? And there is some instrument transformers um, for voltage measurement and current measurement. They basically look the same. Usually the voltage transformer has the big box at the bottom, but you can easily tell them apart. Voltage is measured by the... Um, Potential, so it's just connected at one place to the bus bar, whereby the current transformer has an input-output, so that's measured, uh, it's marked as P1 and P2, um, so you want to basically know what's going through the wire, so you can think about that like a man in the middle, yeah, you understand that, right? 
So to re quickly recap this, so we have transformers. Uh, they make high voltage, low voltage. We have the breakers, disconnectors, and the instrument transform. These are the main building parts. We call this the primary equipment. So it's like primary and secondary with ancient uh, disks in our computers. It's also available as in-house version. So everything we talked about except of the transformer which, which sits outside uh, is built in there. So there are measurement stuff, there are breakers, there are switches. Um, that's a picture from a indoor um, substation near Lausanne in Romanel um, that does basically the same. So if you design a substation, then um, we have incomers, feeders, bus bars, and uh, we we design them in a way so we get some redundancy. Um, there are many different configurations. I'm not a designer, so usually you have maybe this configuration, so current flows from income one to feeder one, and now you want to do some maintenance on income two, and then you need basically um, close the center breaker and free up the income too so you can do some work there. Part of this we call a bay and the process within the substation is basically keep the bay safe and then check if surrounding bays may interfere with you. So to avoid that you may be open a contact before the breaker is open. So we need to be very careful about switching to avoid shorts and faults. Um, yeah, so we don't want this, right? Now, if we have a closer look, then the bay area, so that's now a representation logically. Um, we have some control and protection devices. They are called intelligent electronic devices, and it's not the way they are intelligent because there is some military-grade blockchain-supported artificial intelligence in it. No, there was a genius engineer, a clever guy like you guys are, who did some intelligent programming to tell it what to do and reliably do it. So. The information from the bay is being fed into these IEDs, and they might also take actions in faulty conditions and uh, control all the primary equipment. There we have Ethernet again, so now you're getting confident with what I'm telling you slowly. Uh, there's the protocol 61850. We'll have a closer look to that one. There are SKUs and sampled values as well. Um, Part is based on TCP IP, part is Ethernet, and they usually have a local workstation in a substation, so you can sit there and control stuff. Uh, you also have a supervision control center somewhere uh, far away, and usually they speak 104 to the substation, so that's another protocol we'll have a look at. That's all called the secondary equipment. And there are buttons, so if you are working in some substation, you don't want some guy sitting in a seat far away to, to interfere with your substation, right? So there are hard switches to disconnect the network. There are also switches to avoid configuration from remote, so it's basically a configuration lock. My experience with the configuration lock is like, if the technician is going to be ringing up 2 o'clock in the morning for a fault, he doesn't want to jump the car and drive there. So the lock is usually off. Um, also, if you have a generator somewhere in the Grisons and you're sitting in Zurich, you don't want to walk there always to just turn it on to do some configurations. The problem with these configurations is if you configure an ID to say, let's say the line can carry a 1,000 amperes, and someone reconfigure this to carry a 500 amperes, then it will trip if it's going over 500 amperes. So, could be a problem, right? This clock makes me nervous. It says I have two minutes left. Is this true? No, not really. <clears throat> In IC618, 50, we have a logical representation. So these IEDs, think about the physical stuff like 
a logical representation and there are letters and numbering for it, so if you come across these devices, you better have an idea what you're facing. There's a list, so this is your homework. Um, and if we have a look over here, then XSW is a switch, then we have the CBR, that's not Cyril Brunschwiller, that's the breaker. Um, then we have current and uh, voltage transformer, so these are some simple representation. Then we have control switches, and we have a distance protection, for example, that gets the data from the voltage and current transformer to figure if it's, uh, if everything is going okay. Um, we can interfere with the breaker and the switch, and maybe the distance protection can also open the breaker if some, something fails with the, the line, like the, the branch hanging into the, the line. Then there is some interlocking logic. So I told you we don't want to open the switch before the breaker is open to avoid the arcing, right? So they build in some logic to avoid these scenarios. So if you try hack such station, you must assume that there are many, 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 many other devices that, that try to prevent what you are specifically try doing. Okay? And there's also interlocking at station level. So we are just looking at one bay, I told you before. So there are multiple bays, and they want to interfere with each other as well. So toggling a breaker permanently on and off is what will result in ice landing. I mentioned this in the very early beginning. Ice landing is something where the surrounding substation figures that it's coming on and off and on and off, so we'll better not touch it, so we'll isolate ourselves from this faulty substation to keep the network running. So that is what ice landing means, and that is what the guys in the Ukraine 2016 tried on and off the breaker to actually ice land this substation. So I have some tools with me. <coughs> um, there's a box, a small one, that's just a kind of simulator. Um, there is no breaker. I won't spark any arc, so no worries. Um, you can discover IDs, so I did that already. And you see the logical representation. These are the nodes. That's your homework. I mentioned that. Um, and there are logical nodes for everything, and there are also data objects like for the... Um, I'd say for the indicator, for example, I can put them over here. So I fumble, I have two switches down there. Um, I'm, I'm not so confident with touching metal stuff. Uh, see that? So when I switch them, so they turn on and off. Um, and you get the indication messages. I can also, it's just GGIO, so it's an input-output device. It's not so sophisticated. Um, I can operate one of these. Let's say I control it, put it on true. So there is no kind of authentication, integrity, protection, confidentially or whatsoever. It's just, it's there to be used. Okay? By design. Um, but actually, you don't want me to tell you how to switch switches, but you want to know how to switch the breaker, right? That's the cool stuff. So I put this over here. Um, what I have here is a single point control. So it's just on or off. A breaker is actually a double point control. And a double point control means it has more than two states. So it could be open, but it could be closed. It could also be still moving. I mean, a breaker is quick, a few milliseconds, but still, it could be somewhere in between. We don't know. Or it could be faulty. So it could be overheated, could be too much current, there could be corrosion on the contacts. The spring might be broken, so it couldn't close or open anymore. And that, that's what it indicates then. So we want to know what the equipment is doing out there, because it stands outside, there is ice, snow, water, so we need to maintain this. And there are two commands, close and open, that's, that's what it is. So then there is some kind of different sorts of control you can do. There is also normal and enhanced security. Now it's getting interesting. So enhanced security means the client who just does the open or close command wants to be notified about success or failure on the command. 
That's it. Yeah. You could also select before operate. It's kind of you can make a reservation and you are the only who can then operate it. So it has nothing to do with IT security. It should have been called enhanced safety instead. But yeah, the standard is what it is. So to recap the secondary equipment, <clears throat> this is a picture of Schneider Electric uh, IEDs. There is this mobile phone app. It makes me slightly nervous if I see stuff like this. Yeah, so I mean these things belong into a separate network zone somewhere deep buried inside the substation, right? So in the center of the onion model. No idea how this mobile phone app grabs its data. Anyways, so we've had a look at control functions and monitoring functions. We've also figured what these IDs are, these intelligent devices, and designed this everything with a substation configuration language. So there is some substation engineer that does lots of configuration in a tool that creates XML and also ID configurations that are being deployed among these devices, and then they all know what's been to do. Um, Within these devices, we have those uh, logical uh, abstract levels. And uh, yeah, that's it. We haven't had a look at the goose and sampled values so far. Um, but what I showed you over here was just the TCP IP based client server protocol. We haven't had a look at the 104 yet. Um, I have some more tools here. Um, if you want to do a little pen testing in such environments, then um, Nessus comes in, or NMAP comes, comes in handy. So we have NMAP. The port for these IEDs is uh, 102. And uh, I have one in a local network. Yeah, so it knows it's a Vogel because of the MAC address, but uh, this is not really what you want in a pen test. So we, we want to actually take care of the breaker, right? I mean, if we are a red teamer, then a mission would be operating the breaker. Um, there is some cool script. Well, it's a very old script. Uh, it's called MMS Identify. Yeah, and it tells us slightly more. So it's a VOCO model that starts with seven, haha. Uh -huh. And there is even a cooler script. So while, while creating the talk, I figured, hey, the Fraunhofer guys have, together with the company I showed you, the Omicron, uh, the, the tool, they, they built the tool I showed you, Omicron. They also have some IDS IPS stuff, which understands the protocols we are talking about. Um, so they have a huge post on how they supported Fraunhofer to actually improve this thingy to, to bring even more. So that's called the IC61850 MMS script. Here we go. So it displays some more strings. With these strings are not configured in my device. You can, this is just a configuration. You can put any string you want there, right? Uh, usually if you, yeah, put a firmware there, then it will display what, what's configured there. Um, and I thought, well, yippee -yi -yi, that's not what I expected. I mean, you've seen the tool before. It just enumerates all the logical nodes and stuff. So. This tool was developed six months ago. Super. So what? I then thought, well, maybe I have the wrong device. So I went to their web page and I figured, so you need the Vago 750-880. And hmm, I don't know. So I had a look at my device. That's a screenshot from the device there. And I have it. So that that's it, what the tool does. Hmm. So what I expected was some sort of 
kind of showing me what, what's in there, right? That's what we are interested about. We want to know if there is a breaker we can turn on and off. So um, there's another tool that's pretty cool. Uh, it's called Enum. And you just add the IP address so it knows the ports itself. Um, yo -ho! So that, that's what we want, right? So we want to know what's in there. We see all the logical nodes. We see the physical device, the GGIOs here, so the controllable single point objects, one and two. And we have also the indicators somewhere down there. Um, cool. So at least we know what's in there. But we want to maybe also read what's in there. So I have a little script here. Um, that's the read. I want to read the indicator. Come on. Read indicator. So that, that's what it does. So from the enumeration, I basically figure that string, right? I put it all uh, together and then I call the reader command to get to know what's going on with the indicator one. So here we go. It tells me it's currently off. So that's what I've shown you before in the tool where, where they flashed yellow when it changed. So we know that specific um, IO is zero. So that's cool. So we can read something from the device. This tool was developed about 10 years ago. I put it on my GitHub account probably seven years ago. So, and I mean, we want to switch stuff, right? So I have a command that's called IC61850 nuke for a purpose. And uh, I have a little script here, which I can just, for example, turn off the light. So that's what you can do with the string. It actually doesn't support the double point for the breaker, so that needs to be, it's open source, you can implement it yourself. It's all based on the IEC's lib IEC 61850, so it, it's no magic. I guess you're better at that at, than I am, so um, here we go. So I mention it again, if you do pen testing in such environment, so this is no bug bounty area, so it's, it's pen tester area only, so this is our own, our own playing ground, um, but, but be careful. It's really, you could blow stuff, kill people. It's serious play. So um, if we look at the goose, um, I'll show you the other tool again. So we have a sniffer here as well. So it does install WinPickup and you could sniff uh, within a substation and you would see all those goose and sampled value messages. Uh, you, you could use Wireshark as well. So Wireshark supports the tools or the protocols we are talking about. Um, this is Ethernet, so no IP, just layer two, and it broadcasts messages, and the purpose of these messages is to know, to let everyone know when a switch opened or the breaker closed or whatsoever so that everyone knows it quickly, because it's important that they know quickly because they need to react in a failure condition. Um, they could also send out in, in a, a similar way sampled values. Sampled values are measurements from within a bay um, and some other bays want to maybe know how the condition is. And so you can basically broadcast stuff that is going on in the substation using those mechanisms. They're also specified in uh, 61850. And yes, there is no security, so if you sit there, you could maliciously broadcast open and close conditions, you could replay packets, well, you know that. Um, if we want to interact from a control center to such a substation, then we use the IEC 104 protocol. Well, that's the standard setup um, among many, many stations. And these protocols are used mainly in Europe, uh, Middle East, in Asia. So Australia, the US, they mainly use the DNP3 protocol. 
Um, it, it's similar, but yeah, different. Anyway, so you need some translation unit. Um, that translation unit does basically translate 104 to the 61850. So if the control center wants to know about the state of a switch, then it sends the 104 packet. Such a RTU does translate it, sends it to the correct ID, and then reports back the value. So that's how it works. And 104, um, previously was this designed as a serial protocol, so 101. Um, there's the ASDU that does include a type identifier. So is this something I want to monitor, or is this packet I want to do control of something? Um, there is more, um, but this is your homework as well. And then we have cause of transmission. So I want to do an activation of, of a switch, for example. And there's also a common address. So behind this little air to you, we have a bunch of IEDs that need to be addressed. And the address is a number. So the numbering is different for every substation, um, depends on what the engineer designed. So if you want to send 104 comments, you need to have a clue how the things look like, otherwise you're not going to address the correct device. And also for the information objects, there's where the data is being carried. Um, there are some more um, addresses which are sometimes ID specific and vendor specific. So you need to check the, the data sheets of the vendor to figure how to address them specifically. The communication is TCP IP port 2404. There is some sort of kind of ping. So you want to know, is this thing still alive? Does it tell me something? Um, you can also do controls like direct command, select, execute, single, double points, like we've seen before. So this is pretty similar. Yeah. This is a list of a ABB rely on, uh, device. Just as an example. There are also tools, um, you, you're better off with some, yeah, paid tools where once you know the, the common address and, uh, the IOA, then you can switch something on or off, that's it. So not too difficult. Now these little things, some of them, uh, specifically this one has a watchdog relay. So, and you configure it to have the control server or the control center's IP um, as a source only. And if you send a packet from somewhere else or a malformed packet, which the RTU can't process, then that relay will trickle. And if you slam Nessus against it, it will kind of go like, dig, 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 yeah? If you stop Nessus, then it's going to dig, dig, dig for another 20 seconds. And it won't do anything else than triggering the relay because, I mean, it's a piece of embedded chunk. There's no processing power in it. So, yeah, so the control center might turn red because it couldn't receive any of the values anymore. So beware of that if you do scanning in networks. Um, if you run full scans, those things might also kind of go denial of service. This is what the Industroyer payload in 2016 tried. H happened to us as well. So um, the astonishing thing was in this engagement, the junk went haywire and the control servers the center didn't notice, so that was all green. Next morning, they wanted to control something, and it turned out they couldn't. So someone jumped the car and had to reset all those devices in all of the substations around the area. So this is no nice work, yeah? <laughs> Management by sneakers. So recap, um, so speed and availability are extremely important. The other stuff was not a thing. Um, they have other ports exposed to do the, all the configuration, to push firmware. They are sometimes left with credentials. So if you find an IED, that's a line protection, and you can fumble with the amperage, so that the trip limit, then yeah, this is not nice either. So you don't need to understand the protocol. You just take the, 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 the tool from the vendor and configure it differently, and then the rest will be organized by the system itself. There are no good open source tools, so at least I don't know any. So 
There is an amendment standard which mandates certificates, so X509 and TLS for all this communication. So first of all, you need to have devices that support it, right? Then you need to set up a whole PKI, and then you don't need to miss the time when the certificates run out. Uh, so this is a hell of work. Um, some do it. I'm not sure if it's worth it. They also mandate VLANs for goose and sampled values. If you do audits there, there's a standard in Switzerland, so the, the standard for operational technology. This, there is stuff in it, mostly IT related, you know already. Um, you can grab a copy from admin CH or pay a 300 bucks for the Verbund, uh, Schweizerische Elektro, blah, 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 for the same paper. I don't know. Um, the guidance is, well, I mean, it got, it got published 2018. So this was after the lessons in the Ukraine. So when Sandworm team already did two attacks, um, it says, well, the PC you are using for configuring the station shouldn't strictly be secured and not used outside the ICS network. Well, maybe we want to have some EDR. Maybe we want to patch it. Maybe, I don't know. This is a bit old fashioned, right? And still jump stations should, I mean, should, take place by means of two-factor authentication. I mean, this is critical infrastructure. There's no should. We have to, right? There's even more. So they suggest you break the TCP IP layer not to be able to exploit any TCP IP stuff. So they say, take 104, which is TCP IP, then make it over a serial protocol, the 101, which is basically the same, but serial, and then do TCP again. So you add two more devices that could go wrong, right? So you add complexity, and this is like SQL injection. So you, you put the data in front, and no matter how far it goes, the DB will be at the end. So the, the lesson we have learned from the Ukraine cases is they just use the HMI to do something open and closed. So what's the purpose of this? Now I'll wrap it up. So in April 8, we had another attack that was detected and contained, luckily. So they had also destructive code for Linux and Solaris. They had a wiper that was hidden within an IDA uh, remote debug server. And they had built in 104 functionality. And the entire functionality is unknown. So what, what part of it, what he tries is to, to disable the circuit breaker failure protection. So circuit breaker failure protection is if the breaker doesn't open or doesn't close, then it sends signals out to adjacent or or other breakers nearby to actually s open and then save part of the infrastructure. And so they tried to see, disable this one. If you want to get some hands-on with the 104 protocol, then, then maybe grab the PCAP from the EZ website. So feed it into Wireshark and have a look. So you, you get a bit used to the, the common addresses, the IOA. Uh, you can use the, the referenced paper from ABB, from that specific uh, rely-on device, to, to see what they did. So that's pretty cool. Um, in October 10th, they fired some missiles on substations. So this was first was a missile attack. Then the Mandiant guys uh, published a paper where they investigated into a joint effort cyber attack the same day. And what they did is, is it's like the Maze Ransom guys. Like, so if, if you have AV on a system and can't run your encryptor, so you just bring your entire own VM and run that VM to encrypt everything because there is no AV, right? So what they did is they, in the hypervisor environment, they mounted an ISO to the control and command server. They killed the control and command server and fired up their own micro scatter server that took control of, of the environment. I, I wonder how the, how the, the gardens of the grid talk will address that in the afternoon. So 
they tried to execute commands, and this was kind of a, a joint effort. But it turns out we can't create as much damage with cyber as is needed in a war. So cutting off power is crime. So two high-ranking officers were um, issue uh, where issue warrants were um, for arrest were made by the International Criminal Court, March fifth this year. Fourteen days later, these bastards fire a ton of missile to other targets. So, and since March 22nd, so March 22nd, one large and important plant in Kharkiv was hit. And for the entire time, so the last missile hit about four weeks ago. So they're basically destructing the entire power supply of the Ukraine. And now we are sitting here as cyber professionals and figure is what we do. Does it really matter? Yeah? So we figure with cyber, we can turn out electricity for one hour, for two hours, maybe six hours, maybe a day. If you want to really make dark, you need missiles. In that context, is it really necessary we have a cyber department in the army we exercise to how to bring down substations, knowing it wouldn't last anyways, and it's a crime to the, to the, to the public. And I don't know. Is it really necessary to deploy X509 certificates in a substation in that context? Probably not. Yeah. Maybe to prevent from some malware could help. I don't know. Attackers going the living on the land route. And I think we should think about on how we can prevent of this rather than throwing more tech at these environments. This is no nice thing to actually quit the talk, I know, but it's not far away from us. It's serious. Um, uh, and it shows a bit what, what the importance of the work is we really do. Whoa. Thank you very much.